I'm Eleanor Wachtel, and I'm speaking to Douglas Kearney about his Griffin Prize winning book, Show. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Eleanor. This is, yeah, it's been such a wonderful experience and it's, you know, mind blowing. <laughs> I'm going to dive right in. I'm going to ask, why do you like puns? Ha, 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 ha. Because uh, puns uh, team meaning. They, they create the possibility of multiplicity. They create the possibility of mess. Um, I think that they're, I, I, I love what they make your brain do, which is like to try to do two things or three things simultaneously. It's like, it's like I think puns make your brain chew gum, rub their stomach and walk at the same time. And, and, I, and you know, also being, being somebody who grew up listening to a lot of hip hop, you know, listening to a lot of folks in my community, you know, talk trash to each other. Like pun was such a big part of that. Um, and I just, yeah, I just, I know it's a, it's a, it's a guilty pleasure, guilty, but, but I love it. It's funny because I've always been partial to puns and always there's yeah. a certain, as you say, it's layered and there's kind of cleverness to it. And I never understood why you always had to apologize when you, yeah. when you said something, you'd always say, pardon my pun or whatever exactly. it is. Exactly. But even the title of your book show that already evokes several meanings. Can, can you unpack that for me? Mm -hmm. So the first one that I tend to think about is show as in a kind of a presentation, you know, a, a performance. And then of course there's show as a kind of A-A-V-E pronunciation of sure. Um, and you could also make it sure or sure, right? Like the, you know, the kind of littoral space, right? Um, so there's show as in like certitude, there's show as in putting on a show. And then there's show as in a vowel, I'm, I'm sorry, a verb um, saying like, we are showing something. I'm going to show you something. And those are the main ones that I that I think about with the title. Um, and yeah, it's been it's been interesting, you know, kind of getting to that title because at one point um, I was I was kind of really enamored with the idea of, of of a much more ridiculous title, which is actually another line taken from the title poem. And I was thinking the book could be called Under Grossest Show of Feels. And I was just sort of like, I actually had to practice saying it so often. That should have been, that should have told me uh, that that was not going to be a fantastic idea. Um, but, uh, but my friend Rebecca Wolf, uh, you know, sort of suggested I take a different, different, different uh, tack. And so do you have all three meanings in your mind at the same time? I mean, is there a kind of triple uh, layeredness going on as you're, as you're creating? Well, I I feel like some of the 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 things I wanted to, I guess we could say the, the kind of ideas I wanted to make sure I I I hit or connected with, um, sort of do thread through that title. You know, there's for the longest time, um, my work and you know my my practice has been interested in engaging the intersection of entertainment or spectacle and violence, right? So there's always this kind of sense of where is the contact zone uh, for this kind of, uh, the, the kind of horror that can come out of violence entertainment. Sometimes the grotesque humor, you know, like, you know, Looney Tunes is an intersection of violence entertainment, right? Um, and so that becomes that show. But then I'm also aware of myself ultimately you know, being in front of an audience and reading these poems. And so that's another show, right? Um, and then I'm thinking about sort of like the sort of historical contact zone of, you know, of the Middle Passage being like the shores of the new world. And so all of those do sort of thread through. Uh, and in a way, they've been things that I've been thinking about for so long, you know, it's, it's, I didn't have to like, be terribly intentional to be able to kind of go like, oh yeah, I feel like that one fits and I feel like that one fits and I feel like that one fits. Um, I think there was, there was the, the one moment where I did feel uh, like I was really intentionally leaning into the title uh, is the poem, The Showdown, used to be called The Shootout. Um, and when I decided to put it in the, in the, in the, in the manuscript, uh, I was working and reworking a lot of the poems and I said, wait, what am I doing? No, make it, make it, the showdown, and that's that. I think is the is the one poem where I was really kind of I don't want to say mechanically, but sort of very deliberately going like, let's pivot this to fit in here in a different kind of way. 
You've talked about growing up in a household of words. Mm -hmm. What did that mean? So my father loved trash talk. Like he loved to just signify and play with language. My mother did as well, but usually it was my father who was sort of the instigator. Uh, my mother was a, was a voracious reader. Uh, she, I still have some of her like first edition Stephen King's and I remember her uh, and my aunts all kind of starting sort of like little book clubs with each other. They'd pass around a book and you know they would all be talking about that. My brother, he's the reason why through our cousins um, who, I was born in Brooklyn and we had neighbors there who kind of became our play cousins. But through them, my brother began bringing a lot of hip hop into the house in the very early eighties. And so that's, I mean, that's, that's talking. Like, it's like, it's like all of this language being put into the air. And so for me, I just felt like I was kind of constantly being sort of bathed in the language from these different places. Um, you know, my father also was the main sort of R and B or soul music listener in the house. And I remember when I was in primary school, my father worked for the post office and he had like a later shift. And so he picked me up and we would come home and he would play music by the coasters or the drifters, you know, or just like he had this uh this kind of compilation album from the Atlantic catalog. And he would just play music and in his car he had a Harry Belafonte eight track that just stayed in there the entire time. And so, you know, all of those sounds, all of those expressions that were really tied oftentimes to sort of vernacular tradition were just constantly around me. Because you talked about not just soaking in the language, but the, the kinds of music that you say your dad liked uh, mm -hmm. listening to, all the stuff that he picked up from growing growing up in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, and then living in New York. And, and, and it's just, this is all kind of swirling around. Did, did your father sing or make music or is it just? Oh, it was... Yeah, my dad could sing. He could sing. And uh, yeah, he had a, I feel like he had a kind of a, a he, he had a good tenor. Like his voice, his speaking voice felt closer to kind of baritone, but he could do, like he could do some of those tenor high end notes without going into his head tone, you know. Um, but every now and then he would. And he almost always did it when he was trying to be a little comedic. Um, but I kind of feel like one of the things I learned from my dad when he would sing is he would sing the texture or timbre of the vocalist. So like if, you know, if it's somebody who had a, a deep rolling voice, it was a little bit growly, he would, he would do that. Or like if it was somebody with a kind of a high pitched sort of nasally voice, you know, um, he would do that, right? And so I feel like, and I hadn't really thought about this that way before, but I think that that became the way I understood listening to music was, was to kind of get it inside of you and then sort of embody it. Um, and that's been something that I've done my entire life, you know, as a result. And, and, I, and I think from, what, from the bits that I've seen incorporated to some of your own performance. Absolutely, absolutely. You have a poem in your latest collection called The Drifters After School, and it seems to be a tribute to both your father, who, who died five years ago, mm -hmm. and Benny King, who, who passed away in, in 2015. Can you tell me about it, about that poem? Yeah. So, you know, one of the groups that we would listen to a lot was The Drifters. And, you know, this would have been me in first grade, second grade, I think, those two years primarily, or when my father, maybe kindergarten too. Um, when my father was uh, working a different shift. And so he would pick me up from school and I would go home with him. Um, you know, later I learned, you know, as I, as I got a little bit older, I, I learned that my father, uh, you know, had struggled with alcohol and, you know, he was, you know, you know, what you call a, a working, a working alcoholic for a really long time. Fun, I think functional, 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 functional alcoholic. Functional <laughs> alcoholic. Yeah. yeah. Functional alcoholic. Um, and so early and so, so, you know, as I began to sort of look back on memories from that time, you know, I began to try to figure out like, you know, how many times were, when we were, you know, in the room having a great time singing, like how many times was he, was he tipsy, you know, or, or, you know, full on. And, uh, and there's something in that space where I feel like in that poem, I'm grappling with my uh, 
resentment of his alcoholism while at the same time recognizing that, you know, he was not violent, you know, he, he, he kept his job, you know, but it was just like, there'd be this stranger in the house sometimes, this guy that, you know, I didn't, I didn't like who would be in the house. Um, and so there's that part of me looking back, trying to go like, ooh, like to dig into and be like, oh, what are these memories? What are these, what are these memories really about? While at the same time recognizing that, you know, at those times I was, I was having the, the greatest time, you know, just spending time with my dad and, you know, up till he died, you know, like we could just kind of sit back and, you know, kind of sing songs from, from even the contemporary radio at the time. Um, but we had this kind of experience, this kind of bond um, and around music. And it was just a, it was a beautiful thing, but you know, I don't, you know, I, I, it's, I can't leave a beautiful thing alone. You know, I, just, I gotta just get in there and just like, what is this? What, how, where is it? <laughs> it's complicated, it's complicated. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Could, could, you, could you read that poem for me? I'd be happy to. The Drifters After School, Ben E. King, April 30th, 2015. Furman Kearney, March 1st. 2017. Once King's cream and creek throat work drifted, my mind off eating jiff with jelly and I spun. So yellow I was. I had to know, having not. Do I have soul? I had to ask Pops, who'd know, said, son, through gin baleen, then leaned his brown bulk to cello squalls up for air, reached that deep. Grace to scrape popcorn ceilings, roof, my mouths. I tongued the mush of wonder. First, you bust the shell, you mash the nut, you strip the vine, crush concords flat, you break the bread, then take the knife. Son, out his head tone. There goes his baby, who'd know soon what whiffs of fun were gin, though fun, though still feels in tide will drift from rough to clement glass. When I learn the man has passed, my won't cry, I won't cry, breaks on a crooner gone to sing alone, in his mouth an ocean of done tune. I don't know, I need a minute. <laughs> it's just, uh, I, I think it's the I won't cry. I mean, I, I, when I think of the drifters, I think of, you know, Stand By Me and There Goes yeah. My Baby. But then there's also, you know, Save the Last Dance for Me and there's yeah. some, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, this magic moment, you know. Oh, I love that one. Yeah, yeah. What did your dad think of your poetry? So, he was, he was, he kind of joked with me about like, about cussing in it, um, mm. um, you know, and that was, that was pure slapstick. <laughs> um, um, I think, you know, like the weirder it got, the more I think he was just like, all right, you, you have an event, I'll come see you. And, I, and he was proud of me, like, you know, he was proud of it. And, you know, I don't think, and I don't mean, I don't think he understood it in some kind of like intellectual capacity. I would think he was sort of like, I don't know why you would do it that way, but okay. Um, there was one poem that I did write that was dedicated to him. And I remember reading it um, at a poetry reading he came to attend. And, I'm, and in there, I mentioned something about uh, gin bottles. And I remember after that, you know, like after that reading, he, he got irritated with me, not because I, I mentioned that he drank, but he was like, I don't drink gin. You talk about Seagram's cheap gin. I was like, I was like, dad, I, I remember throwing the bottles away. I remember, I was like, I was like, you know, if, if, the, if, the, shot, if the shot fits, drink it, you know, <laughs> kind of a thing right there. But, but yeah, that was, that was like the one time that I was aware that he had kind of a, you know, that he had listen to something very specific in one of the poems, but it meant a lot to me that, um, you know, he didn't seem embarrassed that I, you know, accounted for that part of, of our lives together. That was a part of my life. Um, 
you know, and I, you know, and it was, it was a deeply affectionate poem. So, you know, I didn't mm -hmm. give him a whole lot of reason to get, to get angry, but you know, you never know as somebody, you know, who is a functioning alcoholic, you know, a big part of it is their ability for people not to know. Um, and so, so yeah, I think he just, uh, my, you know, my parents just kind of figured that whatever I did, I would take, make sure I was taking care of like whatever responsibilities I had. And I think they, they, they encouraged me to do a lot of stuff um, that has been a serious part of my, you know, write, writing and performance practice. Um, who, they, you know, they didn't know what was going to happen and neither did I, but, but I have felt like there was a lot of support from my family. What I was most interested in, you said, was how language banged into each other. Oral musicality, I love the sound, I'm quoting here. Grew up listening to hip hop, spoken word poetry, where sound creates a kind of logic. How does that work? Sound creates a kind of logic. Mm. So rhyme is patterns, right? And so pattern recognition, you're recognizing either the visual cue that um, cake and bake are, are, you know, are, are similar or you're hearing it, right? So something that rhyme can do, especially like a really sort of saturated rhyme. Um, and I think there's a tipping point. I think there's a way that you can just get so rhymey as, you know, like a lot of late nineties, you know, hip hop, um, you know, was just so dense with rhyme that it just kind of became just textural. Um, but there's a space between that extremity um, and the absence of rhyme, where an idea that might not be 100% elegantly or accurately uh, communicated, because they rhyme, you 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 kind of go, oh, okay, I, I see. You, you make the you make a connection. Um, you know, I think that there's a real reason why one of the most kind of important bits of rhetorical technology for most of my life was, you know was the was the word not mean like do you know what i mean do you know what i mean like you know what i mean right or can you feel me right you feel me right that is about there is there's two things going on like here is this language that i am using to say something or express something and i am trying to express my emotional state or my opinion or you know or just like a, a general thought but there is also the presence of of a body there's the presence of, 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 of breath, of a sociality. And so the asking of like, you know what I mean, as a form of confirmation gets into this space, I think, where we are talking about what are the layers of precision uh, when we're dealing with an actual sociality, right? What do we already come understanding about each other? And so I think that rhyme and other patterns, you know, other like sonic patterns, like alliteration, assonance, all of those kinds of things, and consonants, all those kinds of things increase the sense that a pattern or a link is being completed. And you can sort of sit there and go like, oh, okay, I see what they said. That's not necessarily right, but I know what they were, I know what they were saying, right? You know, and sometimes it's a factual thing. Like there's so many songs that I've heard where somebody ascribes another song to the wrong person, <laughs> you know, but you go like, yeah, I know what you mean. No, I'm not, not, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Oh, you meant, uh-huh, you meant this. Okay. And then we complete that link and the sociality doesn't get ruptured. We don't have a misunderstanding, right? And I think that so much of the musical and cultural production of the traditions I identify with are about are about creating understanding, but also occluding understanding uh, for people who are not in your in-group. Because hmm. you, you, you don't call it visual or concrete poetry, but performative typography. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a very evocative conjunction, but what, what does it mean? So the, the big secret is any poem that is laid out in type um, under the paradigm that I'm about to say, is performative, right? It, it nominates itself uh, into a way of reading. It, it tells you, the way I think about it is it tells you that you are actively engaged in the process of reading. It's picking up a book, seeing a poem that's like, bop, 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 doing all this stuff and kind of going like, okay, 
I'm now going to be making decisions about my reading because I'm being called to do so by this typography. But the truth is, a 14-line poem that's all left aligned that ends about the middle of the page, that is also telling you how to read it or how to divide it up. It's just that it's more familiar to us. We, we, we are aware of, if you, if, you, if you read in English, if you can read in English, you are aware that you, know, you start over the left, you go, and then you go back to the left, right? Um, we don't necessarily, however, remember being taught how to read um, advertisements. Like there's not a class where they say like, if you look at this poster, right? You know, you start here, you go here, and then you go here. But designers have oftentimes used something called the Z formation. There is a design template. You, the main heading, heading is this. Oh, I should probably do it this way. The main heading is this. Okay. Um, <laughs> then the image is that, and there's small print, right? So it's designed around creating a pattern of reading or a technique for reading. So one of the things that I like about the poems that I do that, that are performative, that are like showing off, that are like, um, you know, reminding us of that is that whenever I'm in a Q&A, I get to say, well, you know, like this might be less conventional, but these other poems are also designed things. And that perhaps the difference between one of my poems that's you know all over the place and a poem that's 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 more composed into a into a compact space is that you are counting on the writer to match the conventions of that literacy right so like i'm supposed to start at the top i'm not supposed to start in the middle i'm supposed to start at the top and get to the end but the fact is we can do whatever we want <laughs> we can do whatever we want. But, but you, 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 in fact, kind of encourage that because you say it, it, it was a way, this hybrid of poetry and graphic design was a way for you to turn the page into a stage. Now I know there, there's the rhyme, but it's also yep. a truth. I mean, it's, yep. it's, it's a truth, you know, it's a, it's a space like that. And, yep. and, and it's interesting because some, some critics have pointed out that this book show has a bit more conventional yep. design. It's easier to navigate for the reader. It does line up on the left hand side and quite a and, lot <laughs> and so on and but with you i don't know whether it's visual or there's just pleasure in sounds i do feel more than usually that when i pick up your work i either need you to read and perform it for me or i i should read it out loud yes. or should I read it out loud i mean is that orality an essential part of the experience i i i love the feeling of these words in my mouth you know, like, like I think about the poet Donald Hall who described this concept of milk tongue, right? Which is like, what is the pleasure of having, of having to make certain sounds with your mouth? Um, so that is really important to me. And I'm very excited when I hear people say, I feel like I have to read it aloud because that to me is like, yes, yes, like you play it. Here's, this, here's the sheet music, you play it, right? Um, and so there's a there's a there's a massive thread in my work of you know like the encouragement of people reading it aloud as a way of in, engaging it with some of the performative typography pieces. Um, however, I create I've created problems for myself as a reader. Um, you know, as a reader, when I say reader, I mean like being in a public space and reading to people because sometimes I'll have layers of text and I can't do that simultaneity vocally, but a reader with the book can totally stage it in their head. They can look at it and go, oh, okay, I see. There are a bunch of letter A's in front of the word, you know, gyroscope. I know what to do. That I should be imagining the A's are happening at the same time as gyroscope. Um, and so some of my work that I've been doing more recently, these much more sort of you know, like really true collage poems are in some ways designed so that the performer can't actually read them, right? But that you, you know, you could sit there and be like, look at this, be like, oh, I can totally handle this. I know what's happening, um, you know, maybe after a couple of seconds. <laughs> but, that, but that what you would create in your, in your head, the sounds you would associate with multiple textures, different typefaces, cuts, and things like that would probably be more accurate or more meaningful than if I got up there and tried to figure out how to modulate my voice for 17 different typefaces and, and different sizes. I think at some point, the level of kind of sonic overload 
um, begins to distract from the poem as a as a thing that's read aloud. Um, Although I, I think if anyone could do it, you could. Why, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I've heard you sing too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, here's, here's what you got. <laughs> You were born in Brooklyn and, and grew up in Altadena, California, in the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains and northeast of downtown Los Angeles. How do you think that environment shaped you? Mm. Well, there's a, there's a mechanical way that I think about a lot, that I've had cause to think about a lot. Um, and I'm going to borrow a term and not apply it precisely as, as she would from a fellow um, Altadena and Pasadena, um, Octavia Butler. The, the late the late writer and the term that she had was radio imagination and the way i think about how growing up in Altadena in the foothills really impacted my work in very concrete ways is that radio stations bounce weird um when you're in sort of like the foothills so you know and so like we could be driving and say we're listening to an r&b station we cross one street and then all of a sudden that station starts to share share the signal with, I don't know, a news station, right? So there's R&B happening while somebody's talking about traffic heading into downtown. And then you completely fall out of the R&B song and now it's just traffic, but then maybe turn right. And then the sound kind of comes in and it's Raza radio, right? You know, you're listening to, you know, to, 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 <laughs> you know you're listening to Rancheras or, or something like that. And, and, like, and like that was constantly happening. Like that was just, that was just driving up to grandmother's house. Um, and it was to me the aural equivalent to like driving through a neighborhood that might be largely Armenian, and so you see the signs in 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 that in that Cyrillic. Uh, and but then you cross another street, and then you're in a part of town that is you know you know a lot of like South American immigrants, right? And like now you see Spanish in a lot of places. Um, so so that visually, or driving through Los Angeles on the freeway those times where you could go fast and seeing the billboards change as you went. It's this constant sort of overlapping of languages. And from that you build some, I would build some kind of coherent whole. And so the idea of switching kind of mid sentence into a different register or a different voice or a different timbre is, a, is, is kind of natively how I listened to the radio when I was growing up. Um, and also those, those, those that range of communities, um, you know, I don't feel like uh, like a lot of places like like a lot of places in Southern California, like people mix it up to a certain extent. But you know, you're in your car, you're in, you're moving around like that. It's not going to be like Manhattan, where the fact that we're all here, we all at the same places that we're trying to go or overlap. You're kind of in that sort of presence. But I do feel that. I was exposed to many different kinds of music. I was exposed to a lot of economic diversity where I grew up. Um, you know, Altadena, you know, had really kind of firm uh, class divisions based upon the geography of where you were. So you could kind of, you could, you could be friends with somebody who had a, a, a massive mansion east of Lake um, and you'd go over there and you'd be seeing somebody who had, you know, something, something on uh, Woodbury, you know, which, you know, would be like, you know, lower income housing. So like, you would all be in that same place. Um, you all go to the same schools, you're all doing that sort of stuff. I do feel like that has created a lot of the multiplicity that exists in my work. In, in a review of your book, the poet Victoria Chang, who, who was a finalist for the Griffin last year, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. she says that Kearney's body of work is very much about play with language, yet that somehow feels like it diminishes the political aspects of his poems and his body of work. Perhaps play itself in Kearney's work is a political act, a mm -hmm. confrontation. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Is she onto something? I think so. And, I, and Victoria is brilliant. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that the play at one level is around, um, you know, is around this practice of signifying, which is for a long time been a rhetorical technique that allows, um, you know, practitioners, you know, often, you know, uh, members of the African diaspora, um, the ability to speak publicly in ways that are subversive 
um, either because you are undermining the person you're talking to or you are hiding how much knowledge you have about something else. Um, but the target, <laughs> the target audience who's supposed to understand you um, is not, let me, let me, let me enter that in a different way. The person you're trying to criticize perhaps doesn't get it. They mm -hmm. don't know that you're criticizing. They don't know that you're not telling them the truth, um, strictly speaking. And so that becomes this, this profoundly political act. And, and it's sometimes, and, and you know, it happens in history, you know, it becomes a life or death act. One of the greatest practitioners of this uh, is, is a hero of mine, Harriet Mullen. Um, you know, she had a run of books that were really committed to a kind of an, a, a, a really saturated exploration of signifying pun, uh, multiple meanings. And, and I learned so much from her. Um, the three books that kind of epitomized this have all been collected into a book called Recyclopedia. Um, but originally there was trimmings, there was sperm kit, and there was muse and drudge. And when I got these books in, I think probably 2000, maybe 2001, I was like, oh my gosh, this is everything I want to do. And you can make poetry. This is poetry. Um, but it was so much of what I loved about, um, you know, about pun, about wordplay was in that space. Um, it's funny. It's funny. Um, I had a student when I taught at CalArts um, who, uh, whose, whose name uh, is Shogig Haljanian, I believe. And so that's another show. And, 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 and that show, <laughs> uh, uh, their, their, uh, their thesis was talking about this concept that they were exploring called the party sphere, right? Which is what happens when people who are laborers, um, when people who are um, marginalized folks go to dance at a nightclub, they are now not performing the labor. And so it becomes a kind of a, a stealing back of their body through the through the party sphere. So, you know, let's throw one more show at it and give a shout out to uh, Shogi, who's a but, curator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just going back to uh, near where we began, you were talking about entertainment and violence. Mm -hmm. So is that also a way in which you, is, I don't know, uh, secrete or not secrete, but create another layer in terms of the way you mm -hmm deliver your political, the political import of, of what you're engaging with? Or are there specific things that you want to, to deal with? Mm, wow. Yeah, that's it. I, for a long time, um, I've been really focused on the idea of um, cruelty. Like, like, what is cruelty as a, a, as a human behavior, as a tool? Um, and at some measure, um, I have done this because I want to be a less cruel person in the world. I want to be a person who, um, is not, um, out there being cruel. Um, so that's something I think about a lot. What's interesting is that I've had people, um, who I trust you know, come up to me after readings. Uh, a friend of mine, um, Lillian Yvonne Bertram, uh, came to a reading I gave in, I think it was 2012. And it involved poems from the book Patter, which is all about miscarriage and um, infertility and, and, and ultimately becoming parents. And I read these poems um, about miscarriage. And um, Lillian Yvonne like, came up to me after and said, you're cruel to us. Um, I'd say six years later, I was talking to them about that. And they said, yeah, but I mean, you're a part of that us too, right? Like, like the cruelty of being willing to speak irreverently about something that is um, a source of like profound personal pain um, or being willing to do things with one's body on a stage, um, you know, can be seen as different or modes of cruelty, not only to myself, um, but putting the audience in a position where they are deeply uncomfortable. You know, there's, there's cruelty to that. Um, so when, when, when does one receive consent 
to be cruel. Right? It, it, there, is a, there is the possibility of that. Um, and I guess where I'm, what I'm thinking about a lot is how to kind of take non-consensual cruelty out of my, um, out of my capacity. <laughs> so it's something that I think about quite a lot. You, you you not only write and perform, uh, and uh, you you also uh, I mean as, as well as teach and, and all sorts of things. But how did you come to be a librettist writing operas? And I was thinking, is there a natural flow from rap and hip hop to opera? Mm. You know, I mean, there are definitely things that you can where you can sort of trace, you know, a, a, you know, some tendencies in you know, like especially like you know, narrative rap story story rap and that kind of a thing. Um, you know, and then I think about what, you know, uh, Paul Muldoon, you know, with the trustee, uh, you know, said once in an interview that a, that a, that a song is a poem with holes, right? The idea being that if you're consider if you're used to construct writing poems, then, you know, you, 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 you're aware that you have to do everything. You're covering everything. You're the, you're the lead vocalist, you're the drummer, you're, you're the, you're the light technician, you're the mixer, all of that. Um, so when you, when you are encountering another medium, um, you have to make space to accommodate that medium's presence and to leverage it. Um, and then that question then also becomes like, well, like, uh, what, if you have somebody singing a lyric, I think about that song, uh, Oh Girls from the Shy Lights, where the first lyric is, oh, girl, is that, oh. Now the word, oh, on a piece of paper, it's just kind of like, all right. But, but when they sing it, you're like, oh, I know exactly what you mean, right? I know what you mean by that. Um, opera is fascinating. I got started in opera really based upon the, uh, the things that I've been pursuing that you brought up earlier about like creating the page as a performance space, like making of the page a stage. And so I went to see an opera pr production. Um, my cousin had the tickets, um, but he and, 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 and his, his wife could not attend. So they gave the tickets to myself and my wife, Nicole, and we went. And the entire time I was watching it, um, I kept feeling, and it was, it was the Flying Dutchman, uh, Julie Taymor production of the mm -hmm. Flying Dutchman. And I kept having this sort of thing that I you know, thought of as a sort of a seasickness as I would look up at the super titles that were, being, you know, that were on a screen, but then I'd look down at the, at the, at the, at the performance. And I was trying to track and reconcile you know, the fact that a word that might take 45 seconds of, of melismatic singing could just be a single syllable word. Like, you know, like you're sitting there, you're hearing all this melisma and then the, 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 uh, the, the, the super title just goes love, <laughs> right, 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 right? And so to me- Love, this was, love is a big one. <laughs> it's a big one, right? And so to me, that, that, that super title in tension with the performance itself, this reading, intention with looking was just deeply fascinating to me. So my, my, my MFA thesis project, um, you know, which this would have been about three months before I was officially supposed to be working on my thesis was when I figured it out, was I wrote an opera in a counterfeit language um, that uses um, aspects of the Afro, of Afro diasporic speech acts and uh, vernacular traditions, sort of idiolectic rethinking of puns, uh, re rethinking of, uh, of, uh, of, of objects and nouns and, and, and speech that's inherited from other places. Um, and why, that, why, why, did, why did you not only have to, you know, sign yourself to write a libretto, but make up a language? <laughs> well, because the, 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 the problematic that I was addressing, Eleanor, as a, as a serious MFA, right, was, was I had this idea um, that one of the things that oftentimes happens with, you know, material and social culture um, of, you know, Black folks in, in the United States, in the United States, is that there's a kind of a, a pattern of sort of appropriation, right? And so I thought, like, well, what if I made something counterfeit? Um, but with but with enough sort of 
sounds that make a person think this might be from someplace for real, um, that they would want to be able to unpack it. And so, and, and operas made sense to me because of how opera singing, um, operatic singing, you know, bel canto sort of distorts language. It sort of takes it in, you know, when you turn a single, so a single syllable into 15 or, you know, 45 seconds, there's a way in which you're really pulling that language apart. Um, and I loved the idea that there could be super titles with the translation, right? But something was going to happen in multiple scenes that would occlude the super titles. So you're sitting there following along, and then all of a sudden somebody would do something, and now the entire super title thing was blocked. And so now you're just like, what? I, what's, what's going on? And so that was why I did it as a way of sort of like uh, thinking through appropriation, um, because of course I was also appropriating opera, you know? Um, so thinking through appropriation um, and creating something that I felt would be like um, magnetic and then having to create a, a set of rules um, and an actual grammar and like an actual, um, you know, actual sort of uh, etymologies that were, that were based upon terms that I had already created in the language. So like there are things with etymological roots that have no equivalent in English. Um, you know, there are things that, uh, you know, I think the hardest thing to figure out was probably prepositions, um, because prepositions, you know, suggest cultural relationships as well, like up, you know, versus down, like one of those things is not great and the other one is, is great. So like, did I want to bring those same kinds of relations into the, into the counterfeit language? So. Yeah, once I finished writing that, um, turned it in, it actually really radically transformed my relationship to English. Um, you know, once you've had to figure out how to invent something that acts as both a conjunction, <laughs> you know, and, 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 a, and, and a prefix, you know, like you, you suddenly start to kind of go like, oh, wait, the only thing holding these letters together in the language is how close we type them next to each other. So all I have to do is <laughs> move things around. And suddenly this is, this, is, this is speech or this is sound. Okay, before I let you go, I, I, wanna, I have to ask you, uh, what, what, what is it about your lifelong ambition to be a werewolf? <gasps> um, in, a, in a description of a forthcoming collection of, of craft and critical writing, you say there's stuff in there about banter as self-destruction, visuality in poetry, taxonomies for violence in poetry. I know I recognize all that. Then you comes and my lifelong ambition to be a werewolf. Yeah. Really? really? I, I, I have wanted to be a werewolf since I was like six. <laughs> and, and this is because? So, you know, what I, what I kind of tried to think through uh, in, that, in that lecture, which is called hashtag werewolf goals, um, is uh, proprioception, right? Like if your mind is both a, a wolf's and a humans, then you have these kind of two cognitive uh, possibilities of understanding your body in a space. How do you exist in space? Um, and so that to me became really interesting, like, like, like thinking about what it means to be somewhere um, and to be aware of that. Um, so that's, that's, at, that's at one level, the argument. The other, the, the, the desire, the other part of it is like, you know, like, there would be a a release if a person uh, could would stop being a person for, <laughs> for 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 a little while, but it would be a kind of release that um, isn't necessarily about someone else telling you that you're not a, that you're not a human or not a person, but being able to be something different um, than that, um, and yet to still retain some level of consciousness. I know that in most of the times we, we, we talk about the werewolf and they have that, you know, that's, that's like this very tragic place to be, you know, it's a mm -hmm. terrible place, it's a curse. Um, but I always thought, well, that's because they didn't prepare. Like if you prepared, <laughs> like, you know, inheriting a lot of money could be a curse if you don't know how to use money, right? So, so I was just like, I would sit and there's a scene from an American werewolf in London uh, where the actor, uh, uh, David Naughton is, is, like transforming to this werewolf and his hand does the 
well, he's transforming to the wolf. There's, this is another thing I have to say. You are not a werewolf only when you turn into the shaggy form. Your ability to turn to the shaggy form makes you a werewolf, right? So, and I just remember seeing that the special effect they used was to kind of stretch his hands into something like paws, and it looked like it really, really hurt. So I was like, well, I just have to, I just have to stretch. I just have to keep stretching, so that if that happens, I'm like, I'm ready for it, and, I, and, and it won't hurt as much. And then I'll probably be in less agony, and therefore be able to be in more control of my brain while I am in whatever lupine form. Um, so far, no success. Although I do have a friend who has said, "You're already a werewolf," and I'm like. I'm not talking metaphorically. I don't, nah, nah, nah. I'm, I need, I need claws, fur, and the ability to jump really high, like a better sense of smell. That's what I want. Uh, but, you know, she maintains I'm already there. So maybe, maybe the werewolf was always in me. <laughs> <laughs> well, this ability to, to inhabit two spaces, it actually uh, uh, anticipates uh, something else I was going to ask you about because you, you, you put it. You ask a question that I wanted to put to you. You say, mm. in, in all of my compositions, you say uh, poetry, libretti, essays, visual texts. I'm trying to hold contradictions without seeming to resolve it. How do we live in that indeterminate space? And I, I was going to say, how would you answer that? But I think you've already almost answered that. Because <laughs> that capacity to, to be in that indeterminate space is, 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 is practically your comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. It's messy. <laughs> It's great to have the chance to talk to you. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Thank you.